Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this latest update on the COVID-19 pandemic affecting our country. Cheers! Now, COVID-19 is a coronavirus and it's called Corona because in Latin, Corona means crown. You can see here, the spike proteins seen on an electron microscope resembling the points of a crown. Now, there have been coronavirus pandemics in the past, starting from the SARS severe acute respiratory syndrome epidemic caused by the SARS CoV virus started in China in the year 2003, it caused 8,000 cases and 800 deaths. And then we've got the MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome pandemic. This was caused by the MERS CoV virus, which occurred in Saudi Arabia in the year 2012. There were 2,500 cases with a 30% mortality. And this disease is still prevalent up till today. Now we have the COVID-19 pandemic caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Worldwide, it has caused 185 million cases and 4 million deaths. In Malaysia, we now have 800,000 cases and 6,000 deaths. Compare this to the Spanish flu in 1918, it was caused by an influenza virus, not a coronavirus. There were 500 million cases and 50 million deaths. So how is the disease spread? COVID-19 is transmitted through droplets generated via coughing or sneezing. This means it can spread during close contact and enters the body via the eyes, mouth or nose. Infection can also occur when an uninfected person touches a contaminated surface. If you look at this chart here, you can see when a patient coughs, sneezes, talks, breathes or spits, there is virus contained in heavy droplets. These droplets really can spread up to some distance, but the most of the droplets containing the virus occurs in a distance of 0 to 1 meter. That's the reason why we, are, we say we need to keep 1 meter apart to prevent uh, infection spreading from person to person. What are the main symptoms? The main symptoms are fever in 88% of cases, a dry cough in 68% of cases. Other common symptoms are fatigue, sputum or phlegm production, shortness of breath, sore throat and headache. Symptoms that are not common include runny nose or stuffy nose and diarrhea. Another significant symptom is the loss of taste and smell, which can occur in up to 40% of patients. How long does it take to get sick? The incubation period for coronavirus is 1 to 14 days although it usually occurs between 5 to 6 days. And how sick do people usually get? 80% of people have a mild illness and rarely need to go to hospital and they recover after 2 weeks. But in 20% of patients, they get very sick and they need to be hospitalized for severe difficulty in breathing. And 6% of patients become critically ill with respiratory failure and organ failure and these people need to be nursed in an intensive care unit. It takes about one week to become severely or critically ill after getting the symptoms. This graph shows the SARS-CoV-2 viral load versus period of infectiousness. In the y-axis is the SARS-CoV-2 viral load and this is time on the x-axis. And this is when you are exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, after an incubation period of 5 to 6 days usually, it can go up to 14 days, then you start to have symptoms over here. And the patient is highly infectious from day 0 of symptoms to day 5 of symptoms. An important point here is the fact that 2 days before symptoms onset, the patient is actually infectious. And this is when a lot of transmission occurs between close contacts and relatives. You all know the prevention of COVID-19 by now, adequate hand sanitization, keeping one meter apart and wearing a mask adequately. Now, ventilation is very important in fighting this virus. It's, it's been shown that fresh air replacement in closed spaces can actually reduce the chance of airborne spread and aerosol transmission. For other places which without aircons or with split aircons, make sure doors and windows are open frequently 
consider window mounted fan systems, keep the toilet exhaust fan running and ensure an intact water seal sanitary system. Now, for the prevention of COVID-19, what you need to do is, if you suspect you might have a disease or have been in close contact with a positive case, get tested immediately and self-quarantine at home. And while waiting for the test result, make sure you inform the district health office and the COVID-19 assessment center. How do we do this? Well, you can do it from your MySajatra app and immediately report if you got any warning signs and symptoms of the disease getting worse. And what are these symptoms and signs? So these are the symptoms and signs which you need to warn you that you need to go to hospital immediately. If you've got prolonged fever, change in your mental state, difficulty in breathing, worsening of cough, loss of appetite, your fingers and lips turn blue, you've got chest pain, getting worse, and you've, you don't go to the toilet so often to pass urine. Now, there are now COVID-19 variants where the, the virus has actually mutated. It started with the Alpha variant, first detected in the UK, and the Beta variant, Gamma, Epsilon, and now we've got the Delta variant, which was first detected in, the, in India. What is significant about these variants are that it has increased transmissibility, that this disease can spread easily, it causes the most severe illness, and thus leads to more deaths. This is especially so for the Delta variant. Let's talk about the Delta variant. It is 60% more transmissible than the original virus. Hospital admissions occur two times more. And usually, patients who are younger get infected more easily. And the Delta variant causes a more severe illness leading to more deaths. Now, there are a bit of different symptoms in the COVID-19 Delta variant. There's more of a headache, sore throat, running nose and fever. All the signs of a common cold. Cough not so much and loss of taste and smell is rare. How do we test for COVID-19? We've got PCR based tests, rapid antigen tests and antibody tests. The PCR based test detects viral material. It can be positive for a long time even when there are no more infectious. The rapid antigen test also detects viral material and usually is positive when the patient is most infectious. And antibody tests are actually blood tests for immune response to infection or vaccination. For the PCR and rapid antigen test, a nasopharyngeal swab is taken. It's quite a simple procedure and is not very painful. The PCR test is a gold standard with 90% sensitivity of detecting the virus. What, it, what scientists do is actually any residual RNA of the virus in the sample is converted to by the enzyme reverse transcriptase to DNA. Now this DNA is then amplified in, in cycles in a real-time PCR machine. It's amplified by cycles to increase the concentration of the DNA until the, it reaches a certain threshold. When this threshold is reached, then the test is positive. The threshold is called the CT value or cycle threshold value. And a positive PCR test is when the CT value is less than 40. Now this is the result of a negative PCR test. You can see that the SARS-CoV-2 RNA is not detected. The CT value is more than 40. And this is the result of a positive PCR test. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is detected with a CT value of less than 40. Now the Director General of Health has just released a press statement that there is going to be two saliva-based self-testing kits available with a good sensitivity. Let's see how it turns out. Now let's talk about COVID-19 vaccines. There are various types of vaccines available. You've got the mRNA vaccines, viral vector vaccines, inactivated virus vaccines, and protein subunit vaccines. Let me go into it in a little bit more detail for you. Now all these vaccines are pretty efficient with efficacies ranging up to 90%. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine only needs one dose to be effective. Unlike the other vaccines, which need two doses to be completely effective. Now the mRNA vaccines need to be stored at temperatures of minus 20 to minus 70 degrees Celsius. So preserving the cold chain can be difficult. Unlike the other vaccines where they can be stored at a temperature of 2 to 8 degrees Celsius which is normal fridge temperature. So it's easier to preserve these vaccines for transport. 
First, you've got to know the basics of a coronavirus infection. This is a coronavirus. It's got its spike proteins here. You've got your mRNA here, and you've got your spike protein gene inside. The spike protein is the one that binds to cells to enable the, the virus to release its RNA into the host system. As you can see here, once the virus attaches to the human cell, the virus releases the, the RNA and the RNA takes over the cell function to produce more viruses and thus you get an infection. For an mRNA vaccine, you see the mRNA is inside the virus here. What scientists have done is they've replicated this mRNA and then packaged it in a lipid nanoparticle to make it stable. This is injected into the human being. And when it's injected into the human being, the mRNA is released into the cell and the whole cell starts making viral proteins. And this generates an immune response and creates the immunity. The two examples of mRNA vaccines available now are the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccines. Now this is the mechanism of a viral vector vaccine. What scientists have done is they've encoded the gene for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and closed it in a viral vector. In this case, the viral vector used is actually an adenovirus which causes the common cold in chimpanzees but is harmless to humans. So the spike protein gene is enclosed in this viral vector and this is injected into the patient. This stimulates an immune response and thus creates immunity to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now there are three viral vector vaccines available. First one is the Johnson & Johnson viral vector vaccine from the US. And then we've got the AstraZeneca viral vector vaccine, also marketed as COVID Shield in India. And then we've got the Sputnik V vaccine from Russia. The third type of vaccines are the inactivated virus vaccines. These are actually basically SARS-CoV-2 viruses which have been attenuated or inactivated by chemicals. And then an adjuvant is added to stimulate the immune response when it's injected into the human host. When it's injected into the human host, this stimulates the human host to create an immune response. The marketed inactivated virus vaccines are the two Chinese vaccines, the Sinovac and Sinopharm and Covaxin from India. The fourth type of vaccine available is the protein subunit vaccine. Basically, the SARS-CoV-2 gene is injected into animal cells to stimulate the production of viral proteins. Now, these proteins are then isolated, purified. Some adjuvants are then added to boost the immune response. And this complex is then injected into the patient and this generates an immune response to confer immunity. Now, the only Protein subunit vaccines still undergoing trials are this, is the Novavax vaccine from the US. Now I know that the efficacy rates of differ, all these vaccines differ, but not to worry. What is important is that all these vaccines have almost 100% efficacy in preventing death and also in preventing serious illnesses. Now let me use the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccine as examples to illustrate this point which I think applies to all vaccines too. Both the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines confers good immunity in preven the prevention of symptomatic infection even after one dose. It's 76% for the AstraZeneca and 85% for the Pfizer. After two doses, the immunity goes up even more. It's 94% for the Pfizer and 90% for the AstraZeneca. What about immunity against the Delta variant? After one dose, the Pfizer and AstraZeneca only confers 30% immunity, but not to worry. After the second dose, the immunity goes up to 90% for the Pfizer and 60% for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, even better news here. For the prevention of severe illness and hospitalization, the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines both give good immunity even after the first dose against the Delta variant. And if you've completed your vaccinations after the second dose the immunity goes up to more than 90 percent so even having exposure to the delta variant is not a problem if you have been fully vaccinated what about the covid 19 situation in israel 
Israel has completely vaccinated 5 out of its 9 million population. And although there is a current rise in cases due to the Delta variant, the number of severe cases are only in the 30s to 40s, unlike before when it was in the hundreds. So the take-home message is, vaccinations do work. What about mix and match vaccines? This is not a new concept, it has been studied before. And early studies in Europe have shown improved protection if you mix and match your vaccines. But what is important is if you want to mix and match, it must be of two different types of vaccine. Example, the mRNA and the viral vector vaccine. If you mix and match two same types of vaccine, then there is not much improvement in protection. In Malaysia, the decision has been made not to mix and match vaccines yet. So if you got your first dose of a particular vaccine, you'll get the same dose for the next one. Most common side effects are mild and should not last longer than a week. You might get a sore arm, feeling tired, headache, aches and pains or feeling sick and there might be a transient fever for one or two days. There's a, the incidence of severe allergic reactions are 11 cases per million doses and this occurs usually within minutes and that's why you're kept in the vaccine center for about 15 minutes before you are discharged. Blood clotting. The incidence of blood clotting are 9 cases in a million doses and the symptoms start to appear around 4 days to about 4 weeks after being vaccinated. The warning signs are a severe headache which is not giving, getting better, a rash or bruise on yourself of shortness of breath and pain, swelling of your legs and tummy pains. Myocarditis or heart inflammation. The incidence is 1.25 cases per 100,000 doses and most of it is mild. Heart inflammation occurs usually in younger patients and the warning signs are chest pain, shortness of breath or palpitations occurring within a few days of being vaccinated. Now let's talk about the ivermectin controversy. Ivermectin, why a potential COVID treatment isn't recommended for use? Now ivermectin is an antiparasitic agent approved for use by WHO and FDA. It is thought to also have antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. The hype about ivermectin occurred when this paper was published by an Australian group. They found that the drug ivermectin inhibited the replication of SARS-CoV-2 in test tubes in vitro, not in human beings. Following this, this group of doctors called Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance led by Paul Marek and first author Pierre Corey. They, did, they published a review article which showed that there's improved outcome using ivermectin in the prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19 and it was published in Frontiers in Pharmacology in January 2021. Subsequently, the journal retracted this paper in March 2021 because they felt upon review that a lot of the papers quoted had insignificant statistical significance and also at times there wasn't the proper use of control groups in the studies. The authors also promoted their own specific ivermectin based treatment and so a general fact this was inappropriate for a review article. This is why the journal removed the controversial paper from its publication. And its chief executive editor came out with a statement saying that the journal takes a firm stance against unbalanced and unsupported scientific conclusions. Furthermore, the producers of ivermectin, Merck, also came out with a statement saying that there was no evidence that ivermectin worked in patients with COVID-19 disease. In fact, if you look at statements from the FDA and NIH from the US and the World Health Organization, they also do not recommend ivermectin. They felt that there was insufficient data to recommend it and called for more adequately powered randomized trials to be done on this drug. In fact, we now have this randomized double blind placebo controlled trial just published from Argentina. A trial of 500 patients, we actually showed that ivermectin had no significant effect in preventing COVID-19 hospitalization. In fact, patients who receive ivermectin require life support earlier than those not receiving ivermectin. So would I use ivermectin? No, I would not use it. I would still await further studies on its outcome and use in COVID-19 patients. 
Now some take home messages for you today. Remember it is always safer to frequently wash your hands and clean your hands and not wear gloves all the time. Wearing gloves all the time risks transferring germs from one surface to another and contaminating your hands. Health workers only wear gloves for specific tasks. The amount of alcohol-based sanitizer you use matters. Apply a palmful of alcohol-based sanitizer to all surfaces of your hand. Rub it until they are completely dry and the procedure should last 20 to 30 seconds. Vitamins, mineral, mineral supplements, etc. cannot cure COVID. You need to have enough of those for a well-functioning immune system. But taking doses and excess of normal is not useful. Fact, clinical trials have confirmed that hydroxychloroquine does not prevent illness or death from COVID-19. The use of steroids is important, but it must be used by a doctor. It only should be used in a certain stage of a disease. So leave it to your doctor to decide when is a good time to use steroids like dexamethasone and hydrocortisone. Do not try to start it on your own. If you take it too early in the illness, it actually makes things worse. In conclusion, the take home message for you today is COVID-19 is here to stay, we have to live with it, but adequate vaccinations will eventually enable us to live normal lives. Cheers! Finally, if you want more medical content, lifestyle content, travel content, please check out my YouTube channel Life at 50 with no space in between for more interesting videos. Cheers!